Thor, get in here. Hi, yes, yes, what's up? What is going on here? <laughs> well, silly old me thought, hey, I'll start a writing channel. How hard could it be? We can do advice and stuff about the writing community. But oh, me and my hubris. The algorithm is a fickle mistress. Apparently the overlords like when I talk about writing history, world history, royal Egypt, and the Book of the Dead. So while I was going to do a video about POV, we're changing course and doing a death battle between ancient Egypt and Sumerian culture. What? Hello, uh, historians, I guess. I'm A. Uthor. And my name's Jasmine Moore. And the terms books, stories, and literature are often used interchangeably. That's why when you Google what's the oldest book, story, or literature, you generally get the same answer for all three, being the Epic of Gilgamesh. However, academically, they have different definitions, so the answer should be different for each. For example, a story isn't bound by medium. A novel tells a story, a movie tells a story, oral tradition tells a story. So the oldest story in the world long predates writing. The oldest literature in the world is confined to writing, but there's an emphasis on how it is written. Is it just a couple lines about, wow, this pharaoh is great, or does it actually contain writing prose? This is why Gilgamesh is considered the oldest of literary significance. The oldest book in the world? Well, that's a murkier definition. Some definitions say it has to be ink and paper bound in a cover. Others consider a book to be any body of work regardless of plot or structure. And still more say that a book is any body of textual work made with artistic intention, including things like proverbs. For our purposes, we're going by the last one. So the honor of the oldest book ever discovered goes to a piece of wisdom literature known as the Instructions of Shudupak, coming from the ancient Sumerian culture. Or the teachings of Horjadef from the land of pharaohs, mummies, pyramids, and King Tut. And there's probably plenty more waiting for archaeologists to find. When you start dating artifacts back to the time of the Indus River Valley civilization and Akkadian cultures, we usually don't land on one specific year. At best, we know a time frame of tens of years, and at most, a time frame of thousands of years. So unless we develop technology to pinpoint the minute that a Neolithic artisan carved a stone, then there are multiple stories in the running for that title of oldest book in the world. And hey, if there are any gaps in my research, leave a scathing comment below. The history of the world wasn't pieced together by just one person after all. So the Instructions of Shudupak is a piece of wisdom literature dated to have been written between 2600 and 2400 BC. It includes some of the usual aspects of the ancient genre, such as the mentor and student dynamic. The story follows the son of Sumerian king Ubara Tutu, giving his son, Zia Sudra, instructions and wisdom on how to live and rule in the ancient city of Shurupak over the course of three eventful sessions. However, there's a lot of conflicting information out there about these characters. For one, Zia Sudra is given several different names in different stories and translations, including Utnapishtim, Utnapishtim in the Epic of Gilgamesh, Atrahasis and Zisuthras, and Zisuthras, and Zisuthras. Wow. In the instructions of Shudupak, he's called Ziasudra, so that's what I'll go with. Not to mention it's easier to pronounce. However, the story also possibly places him as the grandson of Ubara Tutu. This seemingly contradicts the Sumerian king lists that were excavated that say Ubaratutu is Zia Sudra's father. This is especially big because Zia Sudra, under the first alternate name that I mentioned, takes part in a story similar to Noah's Ark in the Epic of Gilgamesh. In that tale, the Sumerian god Enlil notices overpopulation of humans and decides to solve it with a great flood. Fellow god Enki tasks Zia Sudra to create a giant ship to be called preserver of life to survive the oncoming deluge. But we're not here to talk about flood myths, we're here to talk about the early days of Zia Sudra receiving advice from his maybe father. While the instructions of Shudupak lack a lot of flair found in most literature, it does have a good amount in common, which can be seen in the opening narration. In those days, in those far remote days, in those nights, in those far away nights, in those years, in those far remote years, at that time, the wise one, who knew how to speak in elaborate words, lived in the land. In the first session, the king grants his first advice to his son, saying, 
My son, let me give you instructions. You should pay attention. Ziasudra, let me speak a word to you. You should pay attention. Do not neglect my instructions. Do not transgress the words I speak. The instructions of an old man are precious. You should comply with them. The king proceeds to give advice about business, pride, relationships. Much of the advice has a lot in common with the Ten Commandments from the Christian Bible, such as a portion when the king says, You should not speak falsely. Later it will lay a trap for you. Sounding a lot like, Thou shalt not bear false witness. Granted, there's a fair amount of advice that is just straight up sexist or worse. While the practical advice makes sense, the morals of the ancient world weren't always the best. And the session ends saying that the king gave these instructions to his son Ziasudra. The second section begins with the king's dialogue identical to the first day. A second time, the king of Shurapak gave instructions to his son. My son, let me give you instructions, you should pay attention. The second session talks a lot about food. Lending food, collecting food, drinking beer, and so on. Pretty much the same as the first, and it even ends with the same line. A third time, the king of Shudaprak gave instructions to his son. My son, let me give you- Yeah, I think you get the pattern here. The third session includes advice about familiar relations, and some really bad advice about women. And even some Sumerian superstitions apparently made it into the story. You should not abuse an ewe, otherwise you will give birth to a daughter. You should not throw a lump of earth into the money chest. Otherwise, you will give birth to a son. The third session ends the same as the other two, but we then get a two-line epilogue. Praise be to the lady who completed the great tablets, the maiden Nisaba, that the king of Shurupak, the son of Ubaratutu, gave his instructions. Nisaba was the Mesopotamian goddess of writing and grain, and yeah, it's pretty understandable why scholars pass up the instructions of Shurupak when talking about more refined literature. All characters involved are static. The narrative text tends to be very redundant and majority of the text is simply a list of do this or don't do this. However, this is the earliest, <clears throat> one of the earliest stories we know of. The fact that it has anything in common with modern storytelling is a miracle in and of itself. The opening narration establishes a setting, including a time period, a physical location, it introduces the two or three characters involved as the King of Shurupak, who is either the son of Ubara Tutu or King Ubara himself, in addition to his son, Ziasudra, before the latter becomes wrapped up in a flood myth. And the narrator, attributed to being the goddess Nisaba herself, even has a name drop at the end. And if you squint hard enough, it even has a three-act structure, technically. Granted, they're very static with little actual happening besides a massive monologue, I suppose you could argue that Ziasudra changes because he is receiving the advice and making adjustments, but since that doesn't happen in the text directly, that's just literary analysis trying to fill in the gaps. But now, let's jump over to ancient Egypt and see what the teaching of Horjadef is bringing to battle. Experts stated the story to Egypt's fifth dynasty spanning between the years 2465 and 2323 BC. So at best there's only a 65 year overlap? That still puts it in the running. You wouldn't want to be delivering false information now, would you? Wow, okay, I see your game, Chaz. Also known as a similarly named instruction of Harjadef, this wisdom literature spans back into what's known as Egypt's Old Kingdom, which largely spanned from the 3rd Dynasty to the 6th Dynasty. The oldest writings from Egypt usually land in the 4th and 5th dynasties, although it's very scarce. Miriam Lichtheim, a Turkish-born American-Israeli Egyptologist known for her translations of ancient Egyptian texts, believes the teaching of Horjadef to predate all other instructions-type stories found in Egypt. This includes the instructions of Kagemni, attributed to a vizier who served under the pharaoh Sneferu, giving it a possible 13-year window to take that oldest book in the world prize. The teaching of Horjadef has the same setup as Shurupak, featuring a mentor, Horjadef, son of King Khufu of Egypt's 4th dynasty, and a student, his son, Prince Aibra. It has a much less flowery opening, mostly just featuring a straightforward preface to the advice. The beginning of the instruction made by the hereditary prince, Count King's son, Horjadef, for his son, whose name is Aibra. Very matter of fact, this advice was written for Prince Aibra by Horjadef. Hold up, baby, that's not entirely true. Yeah, the story might say Horjadef wrote these, but scholars disagree. In the ancient Egyptian poem, The Harper's Lay of the Tomb of King Intef, Horjadef is mentioned alongside Emotep. Definitely not the unwrapped mummy from, well, the mummy movies. 
No, the historical Imhotep was a high priest of the sun god Ra at Heliopolis, and possible pyramid architect, but he lived up to a thousand years before the teaching of Hordjadef is dated, living around the 27th century BC. I told you figuring out the dates of artifacts and people are hard to pinpoint. The instructions of Hordjadef give some advice, though not nearly as comprehensive as Shudupak. It includes things like watering crops and planning a good Egyptian funeral because that Egyptian afterlife humbles all. Too bad it'd be another few years before the Book of the Dead and Pyramid text really took a solid shape. If you want to learn more about the origins of the Book of the Dead, here's a shameless plug to a video on that. And there you have it, the combatants are set. It's time for a death battle! Does ancient Egypt or the Sumerian culture have the oldest book ever discovered? The answer... But wait, it's... it's Gilgamesh with a steel chair. Yeah, all this back and forth about Shudupak and Horjadef, and they're not even the most generally agreed on to be considered books. They're definitely the oldest written stories ever discovered, and between those two, it's fairly safe to say that the instructions of Shudupak is older than the teaching of Horjadef. Ancient Sumer takes the win on this one. But if we want to talk which ancient civilization has the older, less contentious books, we're going to be looking at a few other examples. In the Sumerian corner, we have the Epic of Gilgamesh, of course, from around 2100 BC. Even older than that is the Enmerkar Lugalbanda cycle, clocking in at 2200 BC at its oldest dating in the 22nd century BC. However, it's still debated on if it's long enough to be considered a proper book because some think it's actually four separate stories instead of one long historical epic. In the ancient Egyptian corner, King Unis returns with his pyramid text from the 24th century BC, lasting between 2400 BC and 2301 BC. Yep, the origins of the Book of the Dead is in the running for the oldest book in the world too. It wasn't refined back then though, so in support is the autobiography of Weni, another pyramid text recounting the life of the Egyptian noble Weni the Elder, dating to the 6th dynasty of ancient Egypt, between 2345 and 2181 BC. Whew. And between all of those, the most absolute ancient literature that archaeologists have dug up, the scholar approved answer depends on who you ask. No, no, it's not a cop-out. The fact that these stories have overlapping dates of when they were possibly written makes it next to impossible to definitively say which came first. There's absolutely a possibility of one work being of its youngest proposed date and another being of its oldest. And stepping back from the obsession of what came first, does it really matter what's older? When we sit down to enjoy movies or curl up with a good book, we're not just watching or reading what the author wrote, but the thousands and thousands of years that went into developing writing, storytelling, prose, characters, plot, setting, everything. Because art is not created in a vacuum, it builds on what came before, a never-ending domino effect whether the chain was started in Sumer, ancient Egypt, or even ancient China if you get into proto-writing. Another shameless plug. Huh. <sighs> That one was a lot of comparison research, but I guess this is our life for a while, sticking to writing history while we grow. We're gonna have to do some rebranding. You're lucky I dig this sort of thing. You just gotta take things one page at a time, baby. Wait, wait, Jazz, that's it! That's perfect! Writing history one page at a time! It has two meanings! The history of writing, and with every new story penned by an author, they're literally writing history, like Shakespeare, Mary Shelley, all the greats. <laughs> I think this is gonna work. Thanks for tuning in, and until next time, imagine I said a new catchphrase here. Catch you later, baby. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for listening into today's broadcast. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and ring that bell to never miss another one of our fancy new fangled 